Well, welcome everybody. My name is Brian Mosley. I, um, I serve as the lead pastor here at the Springs. I'm delighted that you all are here. Are you ready to get into the Word a little bit? Okay, if you have your worship guide, go ahead and open that up. There's a sermon notes in there. Uh, you can follow along with today's message. Where you can read all the scriptures and stuff, and some of the stuff that uh, we talk about will also be up on the screen. So go ahead and grab those notes and a pen. Uh, we're going to continue today in our series on Ephesians, and we're in part four today. And we've been talking about uh, just how amazing this, this book, which is really not a book, it's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. It's, it was important and profound for them, and it's important and just as profound for each of us today. Many scholars call the book, of, uh, the book of Ephesians the Grand Canyon of the New Testament because it is as deep as it is wide. There's lots of profound things, profound, uh, amazing theology in the book, but there's also some very practical, daily, easy things that you can do to uh, apply to your life. So, um, I want to speak just for a moment for to those of us who uh, the church may be new to you or the Bible may be new to you. I want, the first thing I want to tell you is I'm thrilled that you're here. Thank you so much for coming. And I want you to feel comfortable, okay? I want you to feel comfortable and I want you to just lean into this book. All right, because the, the, the words of Jesus, the word of God is amazing and it is life giving. And when we receive his word in a humble way, uh, it changes us. It transforms us by his truth that is found in his word. So if you're here today and you're just wondering about what what church and what the Bible, what Jesus is all about, I want you to just lean in a little bit today. I want you to think about what we're talking about. Uh, and I want to just begin with a with a question. Uh, and it's the question that I think uh, many of us would uh, relate to, and it's this. How many of you are prone to forget things? <laughs> All right, raise, raise your hand. Are you prone to forget some stuff? Yeah. For, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? Forgetfulness is a very natural tendency. We all forget things from time to time, even when we're told specifically, you better remember this, we still forget and we end up saying all the time, I forgot. <laughs> Have you ever, in a, in a panic, said, the, said those words and, and the, at the realization that you had forgotten to do something really major, really important? Uh, that needed to be done. Perhaps you were, you were supposed to pick somebody up at the airport. Whoops, you forgot. Perhaps it's letting, letting the dog out, or maybe it's turning the oven off or the iron off or something like that. Okay, anybody forget to turn the iron off this morning? Okay, no. <laughs> one, of the, one of the weaknesses of a human being is the propensity, the tendency to forget. I was reading this week, and even according to uh, USA Today, two of the most common things people have difficulty remembering, number one, is website passwords. <laughs> <laughs> passwords to websites. Number two, names of familiar people. I was right that. Don't you, don't you hate, when, especially in church, oh my goodness, this is the worst, when you should know somebody's name, but you don't, and you just say, hey, you, it's great to see you today. Uh. That never happens to me. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. But listen, I'm, I'm really prone to forget, to forget some things that my wife holds really dear. All right, any, any men? I'm going to speak to the men right here for just a second. Anniversary dates. <clears throat> How many years we've been married. Um, her birthday, oh my goodness. Valentine's Day, the kids' birthdays. I sometimes forget the things that I told her I would do. Fixing things around the house or fixing a, her car or washing her car or whatever. I say these things and sometimes I forget, right? But who reminds me? <laughs> she always reminds me. Yes, I did. <laughs> 
I would, I would argue that forgetfulness is a problem that affects all of us. No matter our age, no matter uh, our gender, no matter um, our ethnicity, no matter what pace of life that we live, um, we all have problem sometimes forgetting things. And God knows this very well about us, and that's why he, in the word of God, he graciously calls us over and over again to remember. He calls us to remember, and jot this down if you're taking notes, it's up on the screen. Don't forget what God says to remember. Don't forget what God says to remember. As we dive into Ephesians chapter 2 today, we're going to start in verse 11. And the Apostle Paul is going to call the church to remember something that's really, really important. And it says this. Let's just start reading in verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 2. It says this. Therefore, remember, circle that word, underline it. Remember that formerly... You who are Gentiles by birth. Now, guys, just stop right there and just remember, we are, we are Gentiles. Most of the Ephesians church was Gentiles. And what that means is that a Gentile is someone who is just not Jewish, right? And so um, most of us here are Gentiles. And, and he goes on and he says, therefore, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. Underline that word separate. It goes on to say excluded from citizenship in Israel. Underline excluded. And foreigners, underline foreigners, to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Underline those words without hope, without God. I want you to see this morning, I just want you to remember some things about how your life used to be. If you're a Christian here, you have placed your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, your life used to be something. And then Jesus saved you, and now your life is something else. I remember I I was not born uh, and raised in church. I didn't go to church uh, when I was... When I was a kid, I was invited and invited by a friend of mine to come to church. And I made up every excuse in the book not to join him. I said, no, my, I got, my dog ate my homework. I got I to gotta do my homework. No, my hair, I'm having a bad hair day. I got to stay and fix my hair. I cannot come to you, come with you to church. And so I went through a difficult time with a relationship with a girlfriend. It wasn't Ashley, we, but we broke up, thank God, right? <laughs> but we went through a difficult time, and it's, it's, it can be crushing for a teenager. I was 17 years old, and I just loved this girl. And we went through a bad breakup, and I was just down and out, crushed, devastated as a, as a teenager. And I remember calling my friend who was inviting me, and I, and I said, I'll come with you today. I'm at, I'm at rock bottom. I don't have any hope. I don't, I'm, I'm doing my life with, without any purpose. I don't know God. But I see my friend, and he's got something that I don't have. He's got peace that blows my mind that I don't understand. He's got joy that I'm witnessing him live out, and and I'm noticing this, and you know what? It made me curious. It made me curious, and it made me want to know, what is it that my friend has that I do not have? And so I remember going to church with him, and there was something special about this season in my life. It was like my ears were, were spiritually perked. They were listening very carefully. And I remember that preacher that day was talking about uh, the salvation. He was talking about John 3.16. That God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. 
And whoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And I heard that message of the gospel in a very special and profound way. And I responded that day. And that was a turning point in my life. That was the day where I placed my full trust, my life in Jesus' hands. And I confessed him as my Lord and as my Savior. It changed my life. But I remember how my life was. I had no meaning. I had no purpose. I had no hope. And I was living that way. And I didn't understand at the time, the great love of God and what he wanted to do until I heard the message of the gospel. So I want you to just remember today, just for a few moments, what was your life like before Jesus saved you? If you're taking notes, jot this down. Before God saved you, you and I were separate from Christ. We were separate from him. That word separate should, should jar us. You, we were cut off from Jesus Christ. The, before the gospel came to Ephesus, these Gentiles had not heard the name of Jesus. They had no idea that, the, that to have their sins forgiven and, and they could be reconciled to God. They had no idea. They worshipped this idol called Artemis and they feared evil spirits and they used occult magic practices to try to to try to keep these spirits at bay they were separate from Christ with no way of knowing who he was and to be honest with you that phrase separate from Christ should burden us with our hearts for compassion for other people who do not know him and we should have a burden to pray For the people who don't know him. Those words separate from Christ should remind us how important it is to pray and to share Jesus with others. And to give toward the mission of the church. And to serve and be a part of of the church of the living God. God's heart is that no one perishes spiritually. That no one is separated from Christ. That's his heart and it should remind us. Of the same thing. Number two is this before God saved you, you were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. Israel could say things like, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, right? Israel could say, they could say about God that He is the God of Israel, but that is not true of the Gentiles. They were excluded. From the people of God. They were excluded from the people that God had chosen as his own. Have you ever been in a a foreign country? Or an atmosphere that was just totally foreign to you? You you probably feel a little bit excluded like you just don't belong. And the, the people sometimes can treat you like an outsider. Like an outcast. And you don't necessarily speak the language. You don't know the customs. Uh, you're, you're excluded sometimes from conversations. And you, you, you often feel stupid. Or just ignorant. Uh, and you're unable to do the things in that setting that you are able to do in your own setting. I remember... Um, when I was working at City Church of Chattanooga back in Tennessee, I was the outreach ministries pastor. I got, to go, I got the opportunity, the privilege uh, to go on several missions trips, different places in the world. I remember one, one trip we went to the country of Albania. Uh, it's over there near the Mediterranean Sea, on the, just on the other side of the boot of Italy. Uh, but it's a predominantly Muslim country. Uh, but the church of Jesus Christ is growing and thriving there in a very special way. But I remember this one time I was, I was in a church there ministering to the believers. And I, was with a, I had a translator beside me. Of course, I'm speaking in southern English, right? <laughs> and they're translating. And I'm, and I'm just preaching the gospel and I'm encouraging them and I'm telling them how much Jesus loves them and and just equipping them and training them coaching them in their in their mission what they're doing and they're all sitting there going like this 
shaking their head at me like this. Now, usually when I preach and teach, I see some of this. I see some, amen, pastor, that was good. Thank you for that. But no, I was seeing kind of blank faces, and they're going like this. So it, un it unnerved me while I was preaching. I didn't understand what was going on. But afterwards, I asked my host, and I was like, what? did the people just not like me? Did they not understand what I was saying? They said, no, Brian, this is their custom. This is the way they communicate. You say yes like this, but they say yes like this. I'm like, I'm confused. So you're, te you're telling me they were saying amen to me by doing this. They said, yeah, that's right, Brian. You're just confused. You're not from here. You're not aware of their customs. You're actually a foreigner, and you didn't understand what was going on. And so when, when God saves us, we, we, used, we, we used to be excluded, but now we are included into his family. We were excluded from the, from the nation of Israel, from, from being a part of the chosen people of God. But in Christ, guess what? We are included. And number, num, write this down if you're taking notes. You were foreigners, right? You were foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Covenants refers to the several covenants that God made to uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the nation of Israel, David. The promise refers to this underlying promise of all these covenants that, that God was going to send a savior. But be before God sent the Savior, many generations of those Gentiles lived and died without the knowledge of God's covenant promises. They, that could have been easily us today if we were born in a place where the gospel was not yet known. So we were foreigners. Next thing is before God saved us, we were without hope. We were without hope. Without God's, promise, without God's covenant promises, there is no hope. There's absolutely no hope. We, live, we lived hopeless lives. His promise to send the Messiah was the hope of Israel, but the Gentiles had no hope. At least not based upon the sure promises of God. The only, Jew, only the Jews had the hope of the coming Messiah. So before God saved us, we had no hope. Next thing is this. And this is, this is the last one of, 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 in this part. Before God saved us, before God rescued us, you and I were without hope in the world. You were, we were out without God in the world, I should say. We were without God in the world. In fact, these may be the saddest words in the Bible. Having no hope and without God in the world. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but this world is a, is a difficult place. It can be a cruel place. It can be a place where it's very violent. It can be, there can be robbery, injustice, slander, hatred, racism, warfare, disease, death. Do I need to go on? But even if you live a relatively comfortable life in this world, I saw a bumper sticker the other day and it said this, eat, eat healthy, exercise, and die anyway. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Thank you for that encouragement on the back of your car. But, but to face all of life's trials, to face all that the world throws at us, in our society without God and without hope is a terrible thing. We need God. He's our hope. Amen. Paul wants us to remember. Everybody say remember. Paul wants us to remember that these, these things so that we never forget where we would be if the Lord had not snatched us out of the pit. If the Lord had not saved our souls, 
if I had not accepted an invitation to my friend, with my friend to go to church that day, where would I be? I'd still be lost. I'd still be bound. I'd still be living my life with no purpose. Paul calls us to remember. Why? Because if we forget, we'll grow lukewarm. And we'll become apathetic about the things of God. If we forget, we will lose the joy of His salvation. If we forget, we will lose our hunger and thirst to know God more. If we forget, we will lose our motivation to take the gospel to the lost people. So Paul says, remember. Remember your desperate situation before God rescued you. Remember where you came from. Because you need to know who you are. You need to know your identity now in Christ. And that will give you the compassion to reach those who do not know him yet. If we remember. That's why we said do not forget what God says to remember. Amen. But now here comes the really, really great part. Here comes the good news. I just want everybody to to lean into this verse right here because this is what I want to lean into uh, for the rest rest of our time together. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. It says this, but now, (laughs) but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that awesome? You who were once far away, who didn't know God, you were separated, you were excluded, you were foreigners. But now, those of you who are far off have been brought near by what? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, one of my favorite verses in the New Testament, testifies to this. And it says this, therefore, if any man, if anyone be in Christ. Guess what? The old things have gone and the new has come. By a show of hands, let me just ask you a quick question. Uh, Has anyone's life been transformed by Jesus? (laughs) Has your life been transformed? Do we have any former lost people in the building? All right. Do we have any former Uh, addicted people in the building, whether your addiction was alcohol, drugs, pornography, anything like that, any former addicted people where Jesus Christ has set you free, any former hopeless people in the building, any any people who 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 did not have a purpose in life, but now you have a purpose in Christ. Amen. We were once far away. But we have been brought near by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We now have hope. My brothers and sisters, we now have hope. We now have salvation. We now have freedom. No, we're not perfect by any means because guess what? We all have issues. And if you think you don't have issues, that probably is your issue. <laughs> but we all have issues, but, but we're not perfect, but we're growing. In our relationship with God, in our relationship with one another, and we have been saved. We have been rescued because of the great blood of Jesus Christ. And i got to tell you this morning, this is a cause to rejoice. This is, this is why we sing songs at the beginning of church and just lift up praise to God. This is why we sometimes get a little rowdy and shout, hallelujah, or we start clapping our hands or we do things like that. It's because we have reason to rejoice. We know where we used to be and we know what God has done for us and we know where we're going. We know who we are in Christ. This is the reason we lift him up. We rejoice 
that formerly we were separated from God. We were separated from Christ, but now we are in him. Now we are in him. In, in Christ Jesus is the Apostle Paul's favorite term. Favorite phrase. He's used it just, just this far in the book of Ephesians. He's used that phrase, in Christ Jesus, at least 13 times. It means that we are totally identified with Christ. In his death, his resurrection, and his present position at God's right hand, we totally identify with that. And now we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I don't know about you, but that's reason for me to say praise God that I am in Christ. We rejoice that formerly we were far off. But now we have brought, been brought near to God. I mean, think about the power of that. Think about that phrase, to be brought near to God. The creator of the universe, the one who made everything that we see. You and I can be brought near to him because of the precious blood of Jesus. And it suggests to us that we can have an intimate relationship with God. How many of you know that this Christian life is not about religion? It's not about religion. It's about having an intimate relationship with you. And as we pray for our weekend services here, this is, this is our prayer. That, that God, that you would understand that God wants to know you personally. And more than just practicing religion, which is not life-giving at all, it's, it's actually life-draining. He wants to have a relationship with you. Our Sunday services, this is, what, this is what our gathering this morning is all about. To help us to know Him more. To help us to go deeper in our relationship with Him. Now, we rejoice that formerly... We were guilty, we were condemned sinners, but we have been saved, washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. Under the old covenant, in the Old Testament, only the priest could enter the holy place. And that only, only with the blood of the sacri that sacrificial animal could they enter in. And only the high priest could enter this place called the Holy of Holies in the temple. Only once a year on the Day of Atonement. But now, don't you love those words? But now, Jesus' shed blood has cleansed us from all of our sins once and for all. Why? So that we can draw near to God. So that we can have relationship with our creator. Paul's mentioning of Christ's blood reminds us that the, of the great price that Jesus paid to secure our redemption. So we rejoice that his blood washes, washes away our sin and now we are securely in Christ. We have been adopted. We've been included. We're no longer foreigners. We're no longer without hope, and we're no longer without God in this world. All because of what he did. All because of his great love. All because of his blood that was shed. So again, Ephesians chapter 2. Look at it one more time. Verse 13. Make this your memory verse this week. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near. By the blood of Christ. A French, French uh, philosopher named uh, Voltaire and, and an American president uh, named John Adams were both famous for, criti for their criticizing their criticisms of Christianity because they said it was a bloody religion with all its wars, all its frequent mentions of blood, all the, and the bloody death. Of its founder, Jesus. 
What is it about the blood? That normally, normally people think bl- talking about blood is grotesque. But what is it about the blood that has caused Christians from generation to generation to actually celebrate the blood of Jesus Christ? I want to just give you five quick things here. Jot, jot these down if you're taking notes. Here's the first one. Because of the blood of Jesus, number one, you and I have been rescued. We have been rescued because of his blood. First Peter chapter 1 says this. You were rescued from the useless way of life that you learned from your ancestors. But you know that you were not rescued by such things as silver or gold that don't last forever. Look at this. You were rescued by the precious blood of Christ, that spotless and innocent lamb. It's because of his blood that we are rescued. We are ransomed. We are rescued from a life that is just empty of meaning, empty of a relationship with God and the ability to do his will and to live out his purpose. We have been rescued. So that we can do that. Number two, because of the blood of Christ, my sin is forgiven. Because of Christ's shed blood, God is able to forgive us our sins and give the punishment that we deserved to Christ. Look at, look at Ephesians back in chapter 1, verse 7. It says this, because of the blood of Christ, we are, we are bought and made free from the punishment of sin. And because of his blood, our sins are forgiven. His loving favor to us is so rich. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. This truth is beautifully expressed in an old hymn that's called Nothing But the Blood. Have you guys ever heard that? It says this, what can wash away all my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. (laughs) Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Wow. Three. Because of his blood, my conscience is purified. My conscience is cleansed. A huge problem that was created by sin is this feeling of guiltiness inside. You see, God is satisfied with the blood of Jesus as payment for our sins. But we may be plagued with this feeling of guiltiness guilt that is still there this is because when when we commit a sin that sin leaves a stain on our conscience now on God's side when we ask for forgiveness we're forgiven but on on our side sin has left this stain that feeling of guilt comes from this stained conscience from the things that we have done. This, the stain of sin is at, on our conscience, as you know, is very serious. And no, no cleaner on earth is able to clean your conscience. You can try 409, but it won't work. You can try Mr. Clean. You can try Clorox. You can try the greatest cleaners in the world, but it won't work. The Bible says only one thing will work to clean, to clean and to purify your conscience. It's found in Hebrews chapter 9. Think about this. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify your consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. 
For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. He purifies our conscience. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Christ cleanses our conscience, consciences from sinful deeds. And how does he do it? By the blood. By the blood of Jesus. Jesus offered himself. His unblemished. Unsinful. Perfect life. As a sacrifice to God. On our behalf. Therefore he alone is able to cleanse. And to purify our conscience. Through his blood. Number four. Is this. Jot this down if you're taking notes. I have access to God in worship and prayer. Because of why? Because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells Christians they can come boldly to the throne of God. Think about how amazing that is. You and I can come personal, personally and confidently. Into the very presence of God. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19. And so dear brothers and I would add sisters. Now we may walk right into the we may walk right into the very holy of holies. Where God is. Why? And how? Because of the blood. Because of the blood of Jesus. And if you're here today and you're a Christian, you need to know that you can have boldness. You can have assurance and confidence that as you approach God in prayer, you, you can. And he wants you to. As you approach God in worship, you can go right on in to his presence. Not because you earned it, but because of the blood of Jesus. We are no longer far away from God, but because of his blood, we've been brought near. Number five might be my favorite. I triumph over the enemy because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 says this, they triumphed this is the people of God. They triumphed over him who is Satan by what? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Isn't that amazing? The devil will tell us, oh my goodness, the devil works hard to deceive us, to lie to us, to intimidate us. To accuse us. To beat us down. Right? But listen. You can say this. Satan. The blood of Jesus is against you. Satan. I know you're filling me with a bunch of lies. And you're trying to wear me out and bring me down. But listen to me. The blood of Jesus is against you. I read something, uh, and it was by uh, Charles Spurgeon, an old, old preacher. And he said this, the de I know what the devil will say to you. He'll say things like, you're a sinner. And you tell him, you, kn you know you are, but you've been forgiven. And you've been made right with God. He, the devil will tell you of the greatness of your sin. But you just turn around and tell him of the greatness of Christ's righteousness. He will tell you of all your mishaps and your backslidings and, and your offenses and your wanderings off. The devil will try to tell you all these things. But you can say, I know all that devil, but Jesus Christ came to save sinners like me. And that although my sin was great, Christ has put it all away. Why? And how? Because of his blood. Because of the work that Jesus did upon that cross. 
And we can say, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. You're not welcome in my life. You're not welcome in my church. You're not welcome in my family. You're not welcome on my job. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Amen? Amen. Let me go ahead and invite the worship team back up. We're going to end by taking communion together. I want you to hang out um, as long as you can. If our, t- if our team could go ahead and pass out the communion elements, please. But I want you to remember, guys, don't forget what God says to remember. Don't forget what God says to remember. And remember Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. If our ushers could go ahead and pass out the communion elements. Thank you. Let me tell you guys this as they're passing this out. Communion here at our church is open communion, which means we invite all Christian believers to participate. If you're here today and you're not a and if you're not a believer, feel free to let the let the elements pass you by and go to the next person. But our prayer is that you would consider trusting in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior today. Our prayer is that we would know God better. Our prayer is that if we're here and we've been living life with no hope and without God, that you can receive salvation today. You can know Him personally. It's not a religion. It's an intimate, wonderful, life-giving relationship with your Father God. So these things can be tricky. There's a little uh, cellophane piece at the top. Just go ahead and pull that top piece back and expose the expose the bread. Everybody have it. Wait just another second. Would you, hold, would you hold that up, please? The Bible teaches us that we take communion in remembrance of Jesus. The bread that we eat reminds us of the broken body that was given for us. Jesus' body was broken for us. Father, we thank you for your, the gift of your son, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for allowing your body to be broken for us. Thank you for your death. Thank you for your resurrection. We put our faith and trust in you today. Let's go ahead and take the bread. Let's prepare the juice. Juice represents Christ's blood that was shed for us. I want you to repeat this confession after me. Would you hold up the juice? Would you say after me, through the blood of Jesus, I am redeemed out of the hand of the devil. Through the blood of Jesus, all my sins are forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses me from all sin. 
Through the blood of Jesus, I am justified. Through the blood of Jesus, I am sanctified, made holy, and set apart to God. My body is a temple for the Holy Spirit, redeemed and cleansed, sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, Satan has no place in me, no power over me through the blood of Jesus. I renounce him, loose myself from him, and command him to leave me and everything that concerns me in the mighty name of Jesus. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Let's partake of his of his blood. Would you stand with me, please? you say this after me. I proclaim the victory of the blood of Jesus. All right, one more time like you mean it. I proclaim the victory of the blood of Jesus. I am blood washed. I am blood bought. I am blood justified. I am blood safe. I am blood ransomed. And I proclaim the victory of Christ's blood. Come on, let's give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we close this this uh, afternoon, what time is it? It's 12:30. So we close this afternoon. I want to invite you, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to consider that in this moment right here. In that moment where I came to church with my friend, I didn't know the Lord. I came in one way and I left another way. I came in far, far away from God and I left near to him because of his shed blood. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord, but you would say, Pastor B., Today's my day. I want to know God. I want to know him more. I want him to be my friend and my savior, my Lord. If that's you, I want you to just, I want you, I want everybody just to close their eyes right now. And I want everybody to repeat this prayer after me. There's no magic in these words. I just want you, if today's your day, just confess this prayer and believe it in your heart. And God is going to save you just like that because of his blood. Dear Heavenly Father. I come to you today a sinner. I am broken and in need of you. I have been doing life my own way. But today I come home to you. I repent of all my sins. I ask you to forgive me now by your blood. Wash me clean by your blood. And I confess you today as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you that now I'm your son or your daughter. Come on, say it like you mean it, church. Thank you that now I am your son and I am your daughter. (laughs) And my name has been written down in the Lamb's book of life.